Good evening and welcome to the Association for the Study of African American Life and History Social Justice Reading Room, a production that's sponsored by Howard University and the Mellon Social Justice Grant. Tonight we are our theme is no, our theme is memoir as a voice for justice. And we'll be hearing about the book Radioactive. But before we delve into tonight's discussion, I want to encourage you to use the chat, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. There are many who might be from Asala chapters. We want to hear about your chapters and many who attend universities. So feel please, so please enter in the dialogue in the chat. We will be taking questions and answers later on in the discussion. And so if you have a question, we ask that you put it in the Q&A tab. Uh, we have uh, people on board who will be collecting your questions and you'll hear them asked later in the discussion. And I do want to add that uh, this is third in a series of reading room discussions. And you can access the other reading rooms on the Asala website. And please join Asala to uh, get early access to information and know more about the Asala social justice initiatives. Our upcoming initiative is our, our big conference in, at the end of September. And the first day of our conference will be Social Justice Thursday and we'll have lots of, of information and presenters at that conference. And leading up to the live event in Montgomery, Alabama, Alabama, on the preceding Thursdays in September, we'll have a series, Know Before You Go, where we will be interviewing others regarding social justice uh, themes. And so thank you again for joining tonight. I'd like to invite Dr. Marvin Dulaney, president of ASALA, to come and give us opening remarks. Thank you, Marvin. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce the Howard ASALA Social Justice Reading Room, uh, of which, as you've heard, it is sponsored by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and of course, this grant is geared toward helping all of us to understand how important social justice is in our society. And we have a really good program tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Evelyn Higginbotham, who is the former president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Evelyn? Well, thank you, Marvin. And it's just wonderful to always be back at, at Asala. So I wanna uh, thank uh, you also, Michelle, uh, and all of you who worked with Asala TV to make this program possible. I am Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, as Marvin Delaney said, I am your guide into this virtual space known as the Asala Social Justice Reading Room. And it was set up for conversation about important books and articles on social justice. Asala presents this program in collaboration with Howard University's Social Justice Consortium under the leadership of History Department Chair, Dr. Nikki Taylor. The consortium is funded by the Just Futures Grant of the Mellon Foundation. Asala's Social Justice Reading Room provides a space for people from all walks of life, not just academics. We are a virtual place to hear from and engage with authors whose publications speak in compelling ways to the continuing struggle for racial equality in America. And unfortunately, unfortunately, racial inequality has long been indeed for centuries long been a reality in American society. The racial disparities in health and income, the disparities in the educational system and carceral system, 
the racial bigotry and anti-Black violence, such as occurred in Buffalo on this past Saturday, May 14th, remind us of the importance of our voices of protest and those voices in concert with our actions. So in the midst of our tears right now and in the midst of our anger, we must demand social justice with our voices and certainly with our actions. And those actions must include our votes in local, state, and national elections. This is why we are so fortunate this evening to recognize a voice that is literally listened to all over the nation and beyond. And that's the voice of Joe Madison, the satellite radio talk show host. However, this evening, we actually get to see Joe, not merely hear him. And he's gonna talk about his memoir, Radio Act. And I just want to emphasize how important it is to tell our stories. So Joe chose to do this through the literary style of memoir, because memoir itself provides a first person account that serves as the voice of one's own story. And in this case, it's the story as told by Joe Madison with David Canton. And that book has the perfect title, Radioactive a memoir of advocacy in action on the air and in the streets, published in 2021. So I'd like to just talk briefly about Joe and uh, David Canton. Joe, why don't you come on and Dave. Great. Joe Madison and his wife Sharon are supporters of Asala. Joe has covered the Carter G. Woodson birthday celebrations sponsored by the National Park Service and Asala. He served as the moderator for our marquee event for our first Asala's first virtual Black History Month Festival in February 2021. Joe is best known as the Black Eagle, host of the Joe Madison Show on Sirius XM channel 126. Joe has spent more than 45 years on the radio, and he's been encouraging his listeners to become politically engaged. His book has been praised by leading figures, such as Joy Reid on MSNBC, Merle Evers Williams, the widow of slain civil rights activist Medgar Evers, and she was also the former NAACP chair, and Benjamin Crump, the attorney for the families of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Trayvon Martin. In 2019, Joe Madison received an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, Washington University in St. Louis. And he also that year was elected and inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame. He's also in the Black National Radio Hall of Fame. So it's truly an honor to have you with us, Joe. Now also with us is Joe's collaborator on the book, Dr. David Canton. David Canton is a professor at the University of Florida. He teaches civil rights history, and he's also the director of the school's African-American studies program. Professor Canton holds a special place. His work does in the hearts of many of us in Asala. And if you don't know why, you need to look him up. And this is because of the book he wrote, the biography of Judge Raymond Pace Alexander, who was the founder of Asala's very first branch, the Heritage Branch in Philadelphia, well over 90 years ago. And for many of us who remember Judge Alexander, we knew him to be an active life member of Asala until his death in 1974. The biography written by David Canton is titled Raymond Pace Alexander, A New Negro Lawyer Fights for Civil Rights. So I'd like to, to start this conversation, Joe and, and David, by just talking about 
you know, how the book began. Why did you decide to write your memoir when you did, Joe? And, and, and tell us how you, you came to work with, with Dave on the book. Yeah, uh, and first of all, um, I, I'm just absolutely honored. Uh, my relationship with the Sala goes way back, many times sitting in the luncheons and, and listening at the conferences, um, going to the, uh, the various sessions. Um, and I, I can't tell you just, just how honored it is to uh, be able to have this, uh, this discussion and to be invited to do. You know, you know, I think David might be the best person to start with. And the reason I mentioned that, he convinced me uh, to, to do it. Um, as first of all, David was a listener to the show. And maybe David, to be honest, it was your father mm. who was a listener to the, uh, to the show. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, Dr. Canton, you know, came to me and said, look, uh, you, you really ought to consider doing a book. A lot of people have done it, but uh, I'm not, a, and I'll be very honest, maybe I shouldn't admit this in front of all you scholars out here, but I'm not very much a writer. Um, and, and the one thing I tell you what was, was convincing was when he said, look, let's sit down, we'll record. And we did, um, what was it, Dave? I mean, we did- Hours. <laughs> I, I mean, hours, days, months. Uh, David reminded me, Dave reminded me uh, that I think it probably took, correct me if I'm wrong, what, about five years? You started 2011 is when I first met you. And then, uh, well, let me go back. I'd like to also thank you, Asala, for this opportunity. I go back with Asala 1991 in DC with Dr. Alton Hornsby, who brought us to the conference there in uh, 1991 and where you know, ever since then, I changed my life and got me into history. But Joe, so I got the idea from the John Carlo story, the book with uh, Dave Zirin. And listening to Joe's show, he tells great stories. And if you listen to him every day, you hear all these stories. So I said, why don't we sit down and put these stories together? And before I started interviewing Joe, I did my research. His papers are at the Amistad uh, Research Center at Tulane University. So first I went to New Orleans, looked at video, looked at photos, stories give me some context when I ask some questions. Then when I went through his photos, Rosa Parks, Julian Bond, Benjamin Hooks, Jesse Jackson, all the folks that I teach in my class were right there. And that's really when you start to see, wow, this uh, Joe's has a major impact in, in post-civil rights America. And I think that's what makes the story unique because I think oftentimes we forget that in the 80s, there was still much work to be done with voter registration. There's still plenty of work to be done. And I think his story gives you that bottom up activist story and really gives a, a adds to the master narrative in civil rights history. And that's how it started in 2011. I went to DC, talked to Joe, and then we sat down, I recorded, we transcribe, go back, we go back and forth. And uh, the, the challenge for me coming from a historical, like you said, the academic, I'm used to 30 page chapters, <laughs> chapters footnotes, you know? <laughs> and Joe's like, hey, what you doing, man? You know, we gotta have 40 page chapters, you know? So that took a while, but we finally had a good working relationship and it, it worked out. And, you know, and let, let me tell you, you brought up uh, John Carlos and, and I think there's a, in the book, um, <laughs> Radioactive, how I met John, John Carlos. I mean, we all know John Carlos. Right, the, you know the, the the Olympic protest. Speaking of social action, I'm actually in. Uh, I'm I'm out west. I I I found out I had uh, prostate cancer, so I went out west to uh, get prostate treatment, cancer treatment, and I decided to do my show from there and even talk about. I did the show while I was going through a uh, proton treatment because I had chosen that, that method. And so it's uh, 3.30 in the morning out there, I show six on the East Coast. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing my show and I'm at this hotel and, and, and uh, the clerk at 3.34 in the morning says, there's a Dr. Carlos 
in the lobby who wants to meet you. Now, I'm just thinking, you know, well, now what nut would show up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning to meet somebody? And I just told the clerk, send him away. And um, <laughs> so the clerk came back and said, no, this is Dr. Uh, John Carlos. And then it, wait a minute, are you saying, you're saying John Carlos, the <laughs> Olympic, uh, you know, the Olympic champ, uh, champ are you talking about a hero of social justice? Yes. And that's how we met. We <laughs> met four o'clock in the morning uh, in, in, uh, in Palm Springs, uh, California, while I was uh, doing, doing my show. And I, I got to tell you, it was, it was just an absolute thrill. And it's, it was like we'd known each other um, all, all our lives. And I talk about that in, 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 in the book. And, and uh, he became uh, um, a mentor. Uh, he t went into great depths about not only the social justice uh, that he was involved in with Tommy Smith during mm -hmm. that iconic moment uh, at the Olympics, but he also educated me about how it wasn't just about what was going on in the United States. It was also, if you remember, uh, Dr. Canton, it was also what was happening in Mexico at, at, the, at that time. Uh, and so I, 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 got, I, I really enjoyed telling uh, Dr. Canton about meeting, uh, meeting uh, John Carlos. Well, you know, you, you have so many stories and, and I really want the audience to get a sense of, uh, we, we're not even gonna be able to cover all of them. But, I, you, you know, I, I had a couple of questions in terms of how you got uh, so interested in radio because you actually start in college with a radio show. Did you grow up as a child or as a teenager listening to a lot of radio? Did you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, we, we all we, we all did that, Joe, but did you have like a sense of being a talk show host? No, you know, oh, absolutely okay. not at all. The way it started, not the way it started, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I, I started off with uh, the NAA, Detroit NAACP. I was all of 24 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I tell the story of how uh, they asked if I'd be willing uh, to, uh, to uh, become the executive secretary of the Detroit NACP, which, by the way, uh, is the largest uh, NAACP chapter. And, and so they uh, agreed, um, and that's where I started. And one of the course responsibilities is we were we would we would do a lot of then in those days the beginning of talk radio and um um and so i would be invited to be a, you know a guest debate issues uh at that time in detroit you may remember they had this uh this case uh, of cross district busing it was milliken versus bradley yeah that was uh Nate Jones, that he was and, the and that, counsel That's that. right, that's right. And, and so uh, it was a very uh, difficult uh, case, difficult times. And, and to talk about how difficult it was, uh, I, I remember incidents where uh, people in suburban uh, Detroit were so opposed to cross-district busing, uh, there was an episode where a mother with a young, baby actually took that baby and put it under the wheel huh? of a school bus and dared for that the bus to, to move. This is what they were actually doing to try to prevent cross-district busing. Um, I spent those younger years uh, with people like, and I admire him to this day and miss him so much, Nathaniel Jones. And I would <laughs> sit with with these lawyers, these brilliant civil rights lawyers, and listen to them 
uh, before they go into court, after they would come out of court during breaks. And, and, and their position with me was continue your, your activism. Uh, we'll handle the courts, but we need you to be out there in the streets, uh, mobilizing people. And uh, one of the interesting stories was um, how Nathaniel Jones would, and, and his um, team would, would, would take a break and they would eat at the same restaurant in this hotel in downtown Detroit mm -hmm. that the judge would eat. And, and, and this, is, this is a true story. And the waiter and the judge would sit at the same table, same afternoon during break. The same waiter would wait on them. And they would talk as if the waiter wasn't intelligent enough to understand what they were saying. The judge would leave. Nathaniel Jones and his team would then come to the same table afterwards, and that waiter would tell the <laughs> lawyers <laughs> everything that the judge and his clerks were thinking uh, at, 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 that, um, at that time. Well, I mention that because I would, be, I would then be invited to go on these talk shows. Um, and then what happened was a, 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 the only black that was black person that was uh, with this uh, talk station um, uh, left for some reason. And the program director said, would you like to take his place? Uh, you know, you've been out here several times. And I said, sure, let, let me give it a try. Um, and I promised him, I said, well, you know, I, I'll go to broadcast school. In those days, they used to have these broadcast schools that you went to. And he immediately told me, do not do that because anything they teach you in that broadcast school, we'll have to undo it. And that's how I started. And for 10 years, I did a weekend talk show for 10 years, a weekend talk show. And that's really how, how, I, um, how, I got, uh, how I got started. Now, I'm curious to the conversation, I wanna start with Dave and then I'm gonna to get to you about the black eagle, because see, some people may not have Sirius on their cars or in their houses and they have not heard of, of the black eagle. In fact, Dave, you hadn't heard of the Black Eagle initially. Tell that story. Yeah, so uh, as we know, my I grew up on AM radio with my father, and as Chris Rock said, "Don't never touch a black man's radio." So I couldn't touch, I couldn't change the channel. So I grew up with Art Rush Jr. was a black sports talk show host, WABC in New York, Gary Bird, WLIB, <laughs> Night Talk with Bob Law, Mary Mason, WHAT. So in I was Philadelphia. Yep, mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. I got my PhD at Temple. So in my mind, I'm thinking, I know everything about black talk radio hosts. You know how you get young, arrogant. Then I bought my dad Sirius Radio XM for his birthday because he's a San Francisco Giants fan and he listens to baseball on the radio. He doesn't have an ATM card, doesn't use email. He's old school. So one day he tells me, Dave, this is Black Eagle. I'm like, what are you talking about? Black Eagle? Who's this Black Eagle? I'm figuring I'm a graduate student, get a PhD. I know everything about black people. You know, I'm young, you know. And then he said, you need to listen to this guy's show. So then I, hooked, I got on the show and all of a sudden you're hooked. So I had to commute from Hamden to New London. So I got an hour of Joe every day, three days a week. And sometimes those topics were so penetrating. I was, in my class, I would drop what I'm doing and talk about what Joe's talking about. You know, so, so many times I, I took what Joe talked about in class and brought it into the classroom. So really growing up with the impact of talk radio, the Bob Joe Madison's, the Bob Law, Mary Mason, that you get so much information that you're not getting on CNN, WABC, just like with the whole thing in Buffalo last week, I'm looking for a black perspective. You know, BNC went out of business. I have to wait till Joe's show on Monday. So on Sunday, you're scrambling, looking for information. And that's the power of talk radio. It's transformative. And thanks to my father who grew up on the radio, I'm an AM person. Now my kids come along, they want to change my channel, but I could not <laughs> touch my father's radio, you know, but so it was AM with the analog and the, and the screeching. And my kids like, dad, how do you listen to listen. that? 
right? I'm like, you just listen to it. But it's so powerful. That's how I got introduced to Joe through my dad. And fortunately, a few weeks ago, my dad met Joe in New York. So it's all because of his passion for radio, information, getting stuff out there and, and having, like you said, the third ear, the third eye. And it's definitely through Black Talk Radio. And these folks that I mentioned has put me on that path to meeting Joe and getting this book done. So, Joe, you are the Black Eagle. No. Well, yeah, you know, you know how that that came about, um, and 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 there, you know, I there it we had these consultants who would come in during the the beginning of talk radio, and they would oh you need to do this you and we called it uh, formatics. This is how you do this. This is how you do that, and the at the channel was WRC in Washington D.C. And I followed Oliver North. He was, he was doing a talk show. And this consultant was just raving about Oliver North. And I'm just sitting there, you know, okay, okay. And he's the Captain Kirk of the Good Ship Enterprise. And, and you guys are so fortunate to have Oliver North in your line up and down. So I spoke up and said, well, what about the rest of us? And then I, I went out, I, I left the meeting. Uh, and at the time, I, for some reason, I was, I was meeting Dick Gregory. And I, we were in the car driving. And I told him about this exchange. And I said, you know what? I think I'm going to start calling myself the Black Eagle. Now, it came about, be, be, uh, be, I said, well, you know, I'm in the nation's capital. Uh, the the eagle is the symbol of the of the uh, of the country, uh, but I I said you know I'm just going to call myself the black eagle and and did kind of and I said but I've never heard of a black eagle, brown eagle, bald eagle, <laughs> uh, golden eagle, um, and did kind of cracked and said you know well I guess tomorrow morning we're going to be hearing the black eagle and so I I I I, I put that. I started with that handle. Uh, the, now, the biggest criticism I got were from white listeners <laughs> who thought it was racist. How dare you? There's no such thing as a uh, black eagle. Um, and, and, and I never will forget one caller who said, well, if you're going to be the, the, the black eagle, then I'm, uh, I'm going to be the white pigeon. And I said, I said, okay, well, look, then just remember, eagles eat pigeons. And, and, and that's kind of how it got started. Let me fast forward. I met a Colonel, uh, I didn't meet him, someone, a listener of mine, who was a, dr a drummer for, in, and he, was, he grew up in Harlem. And it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Colonel, Fauntleroy uh, uh, Julian, Julian, right? I yeah. think that, yeah, who was a, a he was a, a pilot, a movie producer, uh, and he was a, a gun runner. Uh, one of the stories about him was that he uh, uh, worked with Holly Selassie and mm -hmm. actually crashed the only plane <laughs> that, uh, that they had uh, and and um, uh, and the guy and there's a book called the um, the Na the Black Eagle, and mm -hmm. one of the stories is he got that name because um, it was Madam C J Walker's funeral, and he mm -hmm. parachuted at the funeral and landed at the the foot of I guess the 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 funeral possession, and with some uh, roses. And a reporter in a New York Herald um, said he floated from the sky like a black eagle. Wow. Now, historically, I found out from a Congressman James Clyburn during the uh, first reconstruction, there was a, a state, a, a, a congressman or a, a, some a black elected official who was known as the black eagle. But then what happened was I was watching. A, um, a, a PBS special, National Geographic special about eagles and found out that the largest species of an eagle was a black eagle. 
and that it was uh, 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 in some countries it's the national uh, birth. That just that just emboldened me, and I just hung on with that uh, with that handle all these all these years. And and but you know, isn't it interesting how we you as historians, this is what 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 why I so wanted to work with Dave, because history was so important mm -hmm. in telling these stories and putting it in perspective, particularly as it relate, relates to social justice. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, am, I, I do want them to, um, the audience to get a sense of how much of a civil rights activist you have been. Um, you know, on, on the one hand, you are an activist, like your book says, on the street. On the other hand, you teach activist lessons through the radio. The radio itself becomes an instrument for civil rights activism and social justice. I, I'd like for you to give them a sense of some of the early people who influenced you. I know you mentioned two people who are quite beloved. Um, one was Julian Bond, the other was Dick Gregory. Um, could you just talk a little bit about some of those people who influenced you? Um, played my, a role? Yeah, my, it, my, my, my activism really started in, in, in college. Uh, and we're, we're talking about the uh, mid to late 60s. We were, in, we were, I was a student and we were fighting to get uh, first of all, black history courses on these campuses. And then once we were, and, and, and I mean, and we fought, we fought hard. And this was going on all over the country. And many of you really know this for, for, for a fact. Then once we, were, <laughs> we got the, the courses, we had to get what? We had to get the professors. Mm -hmm. We had to get the instructors. And that's where it all began. And, 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 um, and, and I was, you know, there were, when you talked about people who influenced me, a name that comes to my mind, is they would visit our campuses and give lectures. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember, Claude Brown, the book, Man, Child, and a Promise Land. Promise Land. And, and, uh, and so when he came to campus, uh, they would, the, 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 uh, the folks would say, well, you can, you can stay with, Joe Madison in, at his dorm. And the thing I remember, we stayed up all night long talking. Uh, and, and then Julian Bond uh, was right after the uh, 19, I think it was the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention. He had just been nominated. Julian Bond was a, was a political star at that time. And he came to campus. And they asked if I would introduce Julian Bond, and and uh, and and on to you know at the, before his like his uh, his presentation, and uh, now again another story, and we 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 sort of hit it off, and after the after his lecture, um, a uh, a, prof a professor of mine said, well, how would you guys like to go to the Playboy Club. Whoa, and, and, and the true story. And this was, I don't know, Lake Gorge in Wisconsin. And, um, and so we, we and, you know, here I am, a, you know, a college student hanging out with Julian Bond at the Playboy Club after a lecture late at night. And Julian said, you know, I have several uh, speaking engagements at state colleges in Wisconsin. Would, how about you? And I'm, they're flying me around. How would you like to just come with me? So I had to get permission from my professors to skip school for the next two or three days and flew around with Julian Bond to one campus to another. And that relationship uh, became extremely tight. We we were, I mean, we were just, just, just like brothers, um, and we stayed in touch with each other. And then, uh, and then, of course, um, 
Uh, Julian and I work together on the board of the NAACP. Uh, I also tell this story how, um, 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 you know, we, we ran against each other for chairman mm -hmm. of the NAACP after Merle Evers left. Uh, and it was like the student running against <laughs> the teacher. Uh, it wasn't a hostile of, 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 of campaign, but uh, then it was just, it was people like Clarence Mitchell. Uh, when, 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 when I started working with the NAACP, I was, uh, I had been, and Ben Hooks had asked me if I would be willing to be the political director. There was a, uh, I took the place of a, 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 a man who, um, had been the political director for 30 uh, years, W.C. Patton. Mm -hmm. W.C. Patton for years uh, ran the political department and did voter registration throughout mm -hmm. the South. And one of the things I, I decided to do was, was not to replace him, but I literally hired him to be my consultant. Be, because first of all, you know the NACP, uh, he knew where all the bodies were buried. He knew the relationships and, uh, and he just guided me uh, uh, through that. And, and then it was people like Dorothy Height um, and all of these folks listened to the show. They listened to the show. And at the same time I was doing talk radio, I, I was doing, I was doing the, the, the street on the, I was mobilizing. I was mobilizing. So I used the talk platform as an instrument. I used it to, to, to as an instrument. Um, it, 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 and, and, it, and, and, I, and, and I also tell the story of meeting Rosa Parks mm -hmm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know this, but uh, and Dr. King talks about this in a speech, I believe, Dr. Uh, Kant and Dave. He, he talks about in a speech I remember hearing where a lot of people had forgotten Rosa Parks. Most people didn't, did not remember who Rosa Parks was. She couldn't work in Alabama. She ended up being John Conyers' receptionist. Mm -hmm. and, and I and I remember meeting, going into John Conyers' office for some uh, issue we were dealing with. And I looked over and I said, that's Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's how we met. And she, and she listened to the show every single day, every single day. Can you imagine being in, in, in talk radio and having Rosa Parks listen to your show every day? Um, that's amazing. That's and, that's when, and that's when I, I learned, she, I once made the comment uh, that the mistake everybody made that, you know, well, I understand the reason you didn't get up from that seat because your feet hurt. Man, she said, and, and she never said Joe. She always said, Mr. Madison, don't you ever tell that story again. <laughs> I did not get up. I, it wasn't because my feet hurt. I was thinking about Emmett Till. Mm. I was thinking about Emmett Till. And, and she said, and I made a decision then, enough's enough. And, and, and that's what people, that's why we have to tell our own, our own story and not this commercial uh, view that is out there. And that, was the, and that was what was so interesting working with a historian like a Dr. Canton, because mm -hmm because he could help, you know, I, with, an, with any other editor or co-writer, you sometimes have to explain this. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to explain things to him. <laughs> he knew, as a matter of fact, he knew the history and he could, he had said, well, Joe, well, let me tell you what also happened when they, right. when, they, when they did this and here's what was going on while you were doing that, while you were ver working, uh, working in the vineyards or mobilizing people. Here's what was also going on in the country. So he helped to put it, the conversation in perspective. Yeah, you know, Joe and, and Dave, well, just, just briefly about Rosa Parks. <clears throat> People have started to write a lot about her now um, 
And so it's very clear she was active with the NAACP uh, in the 1930s and 40s in, in Alabama. I think people don't know that Detroit story. And what I found, found really interesting um, is the story that you tell about the boycott in 1985, because I think you did some work with her oh. to desegregate the public park in Dearborn, Michigan. And, and, and just to put a, a pin there, you, you know, you, we, we mentioned, I heard you mention, or Dave mentioned about the post-civil rights era. A lot of people don't even realize that there was a civil rights movement in the North at the very same time that there was a civil rights movement in the South. But even less do people realize after all the legislation has passed, now you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that there could actually be public parks in Michigan that would tell black people, you can't come in and use our park. That's right. And this is what you you dealt with in, yeah, in and, Dearborn, it, Michigan. So, and that boycott was 1985. It's just yeah, yeah. So, so I'd love for you to talk about that. And let, and, me, let me let me tell you how that happened. Yeah. There was a, a, a Dearborn, Michigan, the home of Ford Motor Company. <laughs> Dearborn and Detroit, uh, you know, share borders. So you, you know, you could cross the street and you would be in Dearborn. At the time, Dearborn had an, an African-American population of less than 1%. It was a, what they call a sunset town. And you, you mm. folks know what that is. You got to be out of town by sunset because the police would pull you over, ask for identification. Uh, and, uh, and what are you doing here? Uh, and, and, the, and the lights, but they had this huge shopping mall. It was Fairlane Shopping Mall, it was a regional shopping mall, and Black folk were spending a ton of money at this, at this mall. Well, there was a family that decided to cross the street into Dearborn, go into a shelter, a picnic shelter at a public park. A family from Dearborn, a white family, came over and challenged this black family. What are you doing here? Well, we're having a picnic. Well, you're not a resident of Dearborn. And they, that family then went to the city council and, and, and actually convinced the city council and eventually the mayor signed the ordinance where they passed an ordinance that it, unless you were <clears throat> a resident, of Dearborn, you could not use their public parks. Now, we all knew what that meant. And there was a, another aide to Congressman Conyers. His name was Arthur Featherstone. And, um, and he was just outraged. I mean, he was a firebrand. And again, I'm, 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 he called me to the office and we gotta do something about this joke. This is ridiculous. You know what they're doing. They and and it's and it's almost. It, it, I would say it was de facto segregation, but they had codified. It. They right. you know they they but but they didn't say black people. <clears throat> they just said you had to be a resident. And and again, Rosa Parks was part of this trio. We were all sitting around talking, and 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 Art Featherstone said, you know what, we need to boycott the city of Dearborn, and. That's how I got started. So again, we were in the throes of boycotting uh, a, a apartheid in South Africa. Um, and we, we got together and decided, all right, we're going to hold a news conference, Rosa Parks, myself, Art Featherstone, and we're going to call for a boycott and of, the, of the city of Dearborn. Now, this was just before the Christmas shopping season. Rosa and, and, and Rosa Park said, I'll join you. Hmm. I'll join you. Hmm. And we went into Dearborn and, 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 and announced that, and this was like what they now call what Black Friday. This is like just before, you know, right after Thanksgiving hmm. and said, if we can't play in your parks, we're not going to pay in your stores. And the boycott was on. There was a spontaneous reaction 
uh, to it. And um, I can tell you uh, honestly, all hell broke loose. Um, Henry Ford picked, and this is the other thing we need to tell our own story because we always think black folk get together and it's kumbaya and everybody agrees. Uh, you're laughing because you know that that's not true. <laughs> Henry, Henry Ford, Henry Ford called Coleman Young. Who in the hell is this Joe Madison? Now, he didn't mess with Rosa Parks, but who is this Joe Madison calling a boycott of, of my town? Do you know the impact that it's having? At the same, Because at the same time, Ford was trying to forge a relationship with Toyota. And Japanese are very sensitive to discrimination. And I, and, and he, and then all of these older black leaders, if I started mentioning names and most of them aren't around now, so I won't mention their names, but uh, uh, you'd have to read the book. Man, they jumped me and, and said like, who gave you permission to call a boycott? Do you know you've got Henry Ford fussing at me? And I've got the, and he's building the Renaissance Center and, and, and that. And, and I'll, I tell this story of how Coleman Young and, and some of the most powerful black men, a couple of them, one of them was a federal judge and, and, and a labor leader called me into a Saturday morning gathering. And I didn't realize they, they met every Saturday morning uh, in the lower level of, of this labor leader's house. And they, it was like a kitchen cabinet for Coleman Young. And they called me in and said, darn it, young man. Now again, I'm in my twenties. You have all hells broke loose. You know, you what da 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 da. And they're just raking me over the coals. <laughs> and Coleman Young looked me in the face and, and said, I didn't give you permission to call a boycott. And I, and I said to him, Mayor Young, I, I don't need your permission to call a boycott. He actually, and it's in the book, he actually said to me, Joe, you need my permission to fart in this city. <laughs> But you know, I should what? just interrupt and say to the audience, when you read Joe, he's very candid with his words. Okay, <laughs> well, yeah, so. I mean, that's that's the magic of the book. I mean, it, it, it's got to, it's got to be my voice, but but these your voice. It, it's got to be my voice, and and but he, but then he said, you know what, you you remind me of myself when I was your age, <laughs> and but you know we'll work this out. We're going to work this out. And it was, and, and, but one of the things they wanted me to do was to call off the boycott. It was too late. It was too late. I mean, they figured out about probably about 70 plus percent of people stopped shopping in Dearborn. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I remember, and this to this day, why I love him so much, Benjamin Hooks. They called me into a meeting with Benjamin Hooks. I want this kid out of the town. I want him out of Detroit. Um, and, and I can see Hartford Avenue Baptist Church, the historic Baptist Church, and we're sitting in the pews. And it's just, again, this clutch of, of, of leaders. And Benjamin Hook said something I'll never forget. He said, you know what? Boycotts are successful only one of two ways. They're either spontaneous or they're well planned. Mm -hmm. I know this wasn't well planned because y'all didn't help me. <laughs> and he said, come on, Joe. And he said, get up. And he said, get up, we're leaving. And we walked out of that meeting. We walked out of that meeting. And, 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 at this, and, and here's the point. Rosa Parks never left my side. Mm. Never left my side through that whole incident. Here's what also happened. They decided to convince the city council of Dearborn to rescind the ordinance and, and, and take it to court. Here goes that relationship with the lawyers. The lawyers go to court. It makes its way 
to the uh, Michigan Supreme Court and the Michigan Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional because it was a, a public park. Yes. The chief justice of the Supreme Court at that time was Dennis Archer, who oh. be, later became the mayor of, uh, of, of Detroit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great story. And it's a victory. It, it's and it was a, oh, it was a, it was a, it was a, 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 a major victory. Now look at the city of Dearborn. It has the largest <laughs> Mideastern population outside of the Middle East. Mm. Amazing. You know, Dave, I, I, I thought it'd be great since you teach about the civil rights movement to just share with the audience your thoughts about the importance of the Northern story, not simply the Southern story. And, and how that northern story, I mean, we still see it going on in a number of ways, but um, often when we think of boycotts, we think of the South, um, these strategies are still very important today. Yeah, and I think, well, for me, I grew up in the Bronx, you know, grew up in New York, and obviously you can see how segregation works through your schools, who gets into honors programs, mm. housing segregation, the police, uh, uh, employment jobs, like union jobs. And you start noticing as a kid, all the, the white ethnics got all the good union jobs. Then you start noticing in your school, you know, my school's mostly black, but most schools, all the white kids in the honors program. So I really just said something's not right here. And that I think the Southern model that we, we usually follow, right, is from King 55 to his assassination. It's, it's a nice quote unquote clean story followed through one individual. But we know in the North, what Joe did in Dearborn, somebody's protesting schools in Brooklyn, someone's doing something in Cleveland, someone's doing something in another city. So you have all these mini movements with a lot of local people bottom up. So there's not just this one figure that's going from city to city to city. It's all these local movements with similar issues, housing, employment, education, police brutality. And we see these systemic issues in the North. And when I heard that story about Dearborn, like, man, that just blew my mind because you know how these textbooks work. They give you that master narrative. So when you look at the mid 80s, you're going to talk about either, you know, Reaganism, you know, the rise of black republicanism. But the story that Joe shared with Rosa Parks doesn't make that textbook. And that's mm -hmm. the beauty of us working together. Right. So I have like this mm -hmm. master narrative type of thing. Joe throws in these stories and we work together, putting this together with I'm with the context and Joe's with those bottom up stories to provide a richer uh, portion of Northern struggle. So that story about Rosa Parks, again, she's trapped in the bus boy. I mean, you, you get locked yes. in. Or Malcolm X is a ballad or a bullet, or King is I have a dream. We lock these folks into one little box. But as we know, people change over time. You know, and that, that's the beauty of history. But again, with most people, we put these folks in a box and we don't see their whole, how they change over time. So like I said, Rosa Parks got kicked out of the state of Alabama but continues to be an activist. And that's why this story is so powerful. You know, and it, and, and it takes the page out of the 1963 boy, you know, they boycotted Easter weekend because, you know, mm -hmm. folks be shopping on that weekend, right? The power Birmingham. of black, right, black consumer dollars is, is also big. And I think Joe's numerous times on his radio shows told you know, African-Americans, take advantage of, cons use your consumer power to make people bend. And that's what, he did, that's what he did with Henry Ford, right? Made him nervous, right? And I like the last point Joe said about the internal conflict. My book on Rain Pace Alexander, the generational, right? You get younger leaders pushing the envelope. You have these tensions, but the, the creative tensions, as Dr. King said, that's mm -hmm. what makes history a great story. We're all not on the same page. That's boring. You want to see the tension. And Joe's a younger person, an older guard. You have that tension. But ultimately, like Joe says, you end up on the right side of history. Beautiful. I, I think what... You know, what makes you so unique, Joe, it, it's not just simply this civil rights activism that you're talking about, but that you, you bring it to radio. So you're, you're, you're in the street, but you're also talking about that activism, your voice on radio. Um, I, I, I was moved by that story about the Port Gibson, I think it's called, versus the NAACP. Yes. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Just well, so people, you, just you know, that. people may not remember, but the um, NAACP got sued 
uh, by the city, by Mississippi, state of Mississippi, uh, Port Gibson. Again, boycott. It was, you know, it was a boycott. And at the time, the, there was a, a, a court decision out of the state of Mississippi with their state courts that, that in order to appeal the the uh, uh, the the, the uh, lawsuit you ha and because they had lost it initially mm -hmm. you had to pay I think one and a half times and correct me if I'm wrong the amount of the lawsuit and it it would and it it would have bankrupt the NAACP I mean literally bankrupt the NAACP and so. Uh, we li we literally, the NACP literally had to drain its treasure, and and in order to appeal uh, this this uh, lawsuit to take it to the high next level, and we just and so branches had to send in their their money. Uh, uh, I uh, decided to hold a, a marathon in Detroit. And we raised a, a, a couple hundred thousand dollars again that we gave to the NACP. Uh, bottom line, I remember it was the Boston uh, Convention, uh, and the NACP won the appeal, mm. and all that money could, had to come back to the uh, the the boy. You, I, I had forgotten about that. You <laughs> reminded uh, reminded me of that. But once again. It does. It do, doesn't. It speak to this relationship between the activists on the street and the, and 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 the multifaceted struggle while the lawyers are in the court. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this is and and as I you know th I mean this is 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 what doesn't get told absolutely on on these uh, on on these uh, news shows and 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 and. Uh, and all of these talk shows, and 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 that, that these people, and that's what young people have to understand. It wasn't singularly faceted. It it it, it was multifaceted. And yes, there were there were times that there might be conflicts. The lawyers would say, "Oh man, wait a minute, my God, you can't, Madison, you you can't, you're out there raising hell and." And and I'm in the court, you know. Nate Jones used to say, one time. Nate Jones, <laughs> Nate Jones said that during the, the the cross district bus case, I think I had gotten arrested. Something uh, uh, did something I, I can't remember now. And he actually threatened to keep me in jail. He said I I shouldn't get you know, <laughs> I, but but and he was being facetious, you know, because his added his position was keep doing what you're doing, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, uh, because you need the mobilization, and 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 at the same time, we you know we we'll we'll take care of the, the the legal part of it. Yeah, I mean this relationship between lawyers and um, activists is sometimes totally missed. You know, it's either the only way we can make change is to protest, or right. it, it, and lawyers aren't relevant, or it's that. The only way to make it is through law. And, and what we do see today, actually, if you look at groups like the Equal Justice Initiative with Brian Stevenson, um, and that's another plug, folks, for coming to Montgomery for our conference, because he's going to be one of our speakers, and he's going to be there. We're going to get to tour his uh, Equal Justice uh, you know, Initiative, the, 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 the memorials there. But at the same time, that that is a legal advocacy group. They are lawyers, but they're working with communities and people don't realize always that that combination of the grassroots people working with the, the, the lawyers. But I think what they also miss, Joe, is what you do. And this is why your book is so important for historians and for anybody, is because you see a responsibility for making connections. You you talk about keeping the record, record straight by research. You do a lot of research. You study, you, you provide civics lessons. You talk about um, providing a more correct understanding, context, context. People have certain understandings about politics, but, but they're wrong because they're limited. They're, they're, they're not full, the, the whole context isn't given 
that's what you do. And you emphasize being, quote, true to yourself. It, it's very moving. And I, I'd love for you to share that with us. One of the things, and I've learned this from Professor Ron Walters. Oh, yeah. He's another one of our favorites. Oh. He's no longer with us, but we oh, love him. God. Ron, Wal Ron Walters told me about, he had given a lecture at Fisk University. And he, um, he was asked by a young student and he talked about, uh, he, and he sort of was chastising these students. Uh, what was it, the, the, the Jenny Six uh, doctor? Uh, yeah, Jenny Six in Louisiana. In Louisiana, it, again police brutality issue, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, look, you young people, you got to understand something. You, you, you get on the buses, you get in your cars, you go to a demonstration. Then you, after the demonstration, you get back in your cars, you get back on the buses and you go back to the campus. What you've had is a moment. And what we need is a movement. Mm -hmm. A young student asked him, because he tell, told me this story. He said, the young student said, well, Dr. Walters, what's the difference between a moment and a movement? And he said to that student, all movements require sacrifice. Mm -hmm. it, you you got to have more than just a moment. And when you look at the history, the history that you have written about, and everybody listening, the professors and all the folks who are on this, this, this program, every movement has required sacrifice. People sacrifice their education. You don't hear about the story of the sit-ins and how those students were put out of school, mm. how the president of that university was threatened by the governor. Mm -hmm. That if you don't if you don't stop this, then we're going to cut the funding. It, you know, folks, that, that's the people don't learn uh, uh, about that. All sacrifices re require. I, in 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 one chapter, um, I was I had uh, my first full time uh, talk show was Philadelphia WWDB. I, again, I replaced the only black who was on the uh line in the lineup i did a talk show now get this from midnight to 5 30 in the morning and i'm the only black and this was just after the move incident mm -hmm. and and uh so i had moved my family from detroit where i had a good political base um and i get called into the program director's office with the owner who said, you know, we're getting complaints from our listeners that you're talking about Black people too much. I, I mean, really, this is the conversation we have. And you need, you ought to cool it. You know, you didn't say it in those words. These are my words. But you, you know, and, you know, I was, I said, well, wait a minute, I'm the only Black person. This is Philadelphia. What are you talking about? And they just insisted. So I decided, the next day, I booked Ron Brown, who at the time was running to be chairman, the, and he became the first Black chairman of the DNC, Democratic National Committee. Mm -hmm. And he was a good friend. We were, I remember we were friends from those days with the Urban League. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed him one hour. And then the next hour, I interviewed Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. Well, they fired me the next day. <laughs> and, and look, the reason I did it was because I wanted to show everybody's not Louis Farrakhan. Everybody's not Ron Brown. And, 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 and so they, they I mean, and, and so I real, that's what Ron Brown meant. That, you know, the, the, uh, there's every, 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 movement requires sacrifice and and that's I, I think that's the lesson that black history has taught us when black history teaches us when somebody tells you to sit down you stand up 
<laughs> when, when somebody pushes you back, you move forward. That's, that is really critical race theory. <laughs> that's, 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 that's really what, 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 and that's what I try to uh, do with my platform. And, and to be honest, you, 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 I've been fortunate because, uh, because it's the only job, it's the only time I was fired. And, and so, you, you know, the, I've been fortunate because uh, at Sirius XM, uh, they, they, they know who I am, they know what I am, and, and they make it very clear that I have a, a, a free voice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the things we do is one of the main features of our show, every morning, every hour of, that I'm on those four hours, we start with a Black history fact. Mm -hmm. Every, what well, we call it a Black factoid, and it turns out to be one of the most popular um, segments of our of our show and all it is is a paragraph and mm -hmm. and then and what's what it what is done it is calls people to oh let me check it check it out mm -hmm. you know just just the other day uh, we we uh, talked about during this month how brown versus board of education a unanimous decision no nowhere on rape nowhere on television nowhere on television did somebody anybody mention it Nowhere on television, P Plessy versus Ferguson was decided this month and, and created almost 100 years of separate but equal. Nobody mentioned it. So that's how I try to use this uh, platform. That's, that's, that's wonderful. And it also speaks to just the complexity of who we are um, and the complexity of the various ways we contribute to the freedom struggle. Uh, there's just so many different ways that uh, we have to go down to get to that same story. And those different ways together is what will, will help a victory. I mean, I, I, I think about also the work that you did in Africa. Oh. I guess there could be people who would say, why in the world would you be interested in Sudan? They you know, did. Why, mm -hmm. why don't you? But tell that story because it's amazing. First of all, you go to a place that is very dangerous. Sherry, your wife, goes with you, which was amazing. <laughs> you also then follow it with civil disobedience in the States when you come back. You have a court case about your civil disobedience with the most unlikely pair of lawyers. On the one hand, Ken Starr, the, the man who was, I think the lawyer who was against, uh, against Clinton. And then you had Johnny Cochran, everybody knows Johnny Cochran, who was the lawyer who was defending OJ Simpson. You would never think those two would meet and yet they did. And it, it, I mean, the story was amazing. And then the way you brought Colin Powell into it and then Senator Barack Obama, this is one of yet another great story in, in, in your, your book, but it's also a story about human rights and justice. So can and, you share and, that one? And, and Dave, Dave captured it again. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to explain it to Dave. <laughs> you know, he, we, we, uh, but, but this was, most folks did not know that the, 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 the civil war, and, and, and this was Darfur, this was yes, southern, Darfur. southern Sudan. Southern Sudan. And most folks did not know that, that that civil war had been going on for 25 years. More people were killed during that civil war than all the wars that the United, the United States had, had been involved in. And a group uh, Chris, Southern, I mean, the Christian leadership, I forget, they, they were out of Switzerland, and, and they had been uh, working in Southern Sudan, uh, uh, and, and they came to me uh, and asked if I would be willing uh, to go to the war zone, see what's going on, and with the purpose, again, of using the platform to come back and educate the black community. Now, Congressman Donald Payne, the late mm -hmm. Donald Payne, mm -hmm. he knew about it. He was Mr. Africa in, in, the, with the, with, in Congress at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I talked with him, I worked with him. 
And I ended up going in and out of Southern Sudan uh, at least six times. What was oh. happening at, at every time the Sudanese would attack a Southern Sudan village, they would take women and children as slaves. And they literally sold these folks. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I went back, I, I, I came back, I met with members of Congress, I worked with Donald Payne, I bit, spoke to churches, and you're right, there were a lot of Black folk who said, why are you bothering with, with this, you know, and, and that's because they just didn't know what was going on, but I could use my platform to explain, well, you know that a woman in Southern Sudan who's taken as a slave, uh, uh, it, it costs it cost more to buy a goat mm. than it did a woman. Mm. Um, and when you, when, when, you, when you visit, when you go there and you see it, uh, and, and by the way, you mentioned, uh, and she, she's in every page of this, uh, of this book, and, and, and that is my wife, Sherry. You know, I saw a program the other day, a movie called Mince Me. It, it, it's, a, it, it's about the uh, the deception that the uh, English used in, during World War II uh, as it related to the uh, invasion of, uh, of Europe. But the, in the, there's a line in that book, that, uh, a line in that movie, where this, this guy was introducing his wife. And he said, she has the wisdom of Solomon, mm. the strength of Samson and the patience of Job. And I immediately thought about my wife's share as I sat there and watched that movie. Of course, the other part of that line is she has to have that to deal with me. <laughs> and, 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 and yes, I mean, I am literally amazed that this brilliant, attractive woman would say, because when I came back from these, these visits, I was depressed. Uh, and I would sit just, just, and she says, what's wrong? I mean, what, what, what did you see? And, you know, and, it, you know, it's, it's, and men who have been in war, they know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just can't talk about it. And she said, I'm going with you the next time. Mm. I'm going with you the next time. One of the funny stories in the book is we were we were flying into this war zone and, and this raggedy, I don't know, Russian <laughs> prop plane. And huh. and it didn't and 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 one of the things they do is they take the barrel of fuel the, that the plane uses and they actually put it on the plane where you huh. sit. You're literally leaning against the fuel. <laughs> Now she's a she's a former flight attendant, so she's sitting here talking about where are the seat belts. I said there are no seat belts. I said, but she, and she saw saw this one seat belt, and she says, "What am I supposed to do with this?" I said, "You just tie it in a knot, and that's 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 your seat belt." And then she said, "Well, what happens if if the plane crashes?" And I said, uh, sweetheart, uh, you're leaning against the fuel barrel. <laughs> but she was there. Oh and, 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 and I tell you a humorous story. I almost got married in South Sudan. I didn't realize this. I think Dave will remember this. It, we were at a, uh, a well where the women were getting the water, all right? And there was a young Sudanese, and I, I ended up getting her a, 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 a cup of water, and I handed it to her. And what I didn't realize, that's a sign of proposal. Oh, my goodness. And all the women started laughing, and Sherry grabbed me by the hand and said, oh, no, 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 no. And dragged me away. And, 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 and they were, but, but, they're, they're, but my, my, my point is, and, is that we came back and, and you're right. 
we we bought we ended up getting arrested at the Sudanese embassy. I think it was like every afternoon at 12 noon. And we had grandmothers that came up and got her, handcuffed themselves to the door mm-hmm. of the Sudanese embassy. Um, Charlie Wrangell wow. uh, yeah. came up, John Lewis. And then of course, uh, you know, and uh, 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 the uh, ice cream folks. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, what was it? Ben, ben and Jerry. Jerry, Ben and Jerry, and mm. and, and uh, Danny Glover, and they mm. all started joining this, 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 uh, uh, this uh, movement. So we ended up getting arrested, and ended up in court. We had to go to court. Um, I, uh, I had, we were in, we this, this, we were in jail. We were in jail. Dick was with me <laughs> uh, and a couple other people. And there was this right wing conservative who was bragging about when we get out of here and go to court, I'm going to get uh, 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 what's his name um, to join to, to represent me. Oh, Ken Starr. Ken Starr. I know mm-hmm. Ken Starr and he's mm-hmm. just bragging. And I, and I said, well, I know Johnny Cox. I'm going to get Johnny Cochran to represent me. And so I called Johnny Cochran and I said, would you be come, willing to come to D- uh, D.C. and represent us in court? And but I got to tell you, Ken Starr might be your co-counsel. <laughs> and he said, well, if Ken's willing to do it, I'll do it. Ken Starr agreed. And we met. Uh, at Ken Starr's office, this palatial office in downtown Washington. And you can imagine uh, the the attention that they got when they walked into the courthouse. Ken Starr, Johnny Cochran. um, And we went into the the courtroom and and, uh, it was funny because I knew the judge. I had known her since she was a child, because her mother and I worked in NACP and I, and I kind of uh, nudged my conservative friend. And I said, well, we got this made. I know the judge. Well, she found us guilty. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, we, we, we were. She, you know, dismissed the fine. And the interesting thing was that afterwards, and there's, I think there's this photograph of Ken Starr, Johnny Cochran, Dick Gregory, Walter Fonjoy, who by the way, went to Sudan, uh, Southern Sudan with me. And the, the young attorney uh, representing the government, Mr. Madison, can I see you for a moment? Yes. He says, I just want to thank you. I said, well, wait a minute, you just, had, you just found we were just found guilty. He says, "No, I can now go back to the office and tell my colleagues that I defeated Ken Starr and Johnny Cochran in court." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> we have so much. We're running out of time, folks. Um, so, because uh, I do want to give, our, I, I'm sure our audience has a lot of questions, but I do have a few more questions that they would find really interesting. But you know, I I, I thought. I wanted to turn to you, Dave, now, mm-hmm. just to give people a sense, a historical sense of what Black Talk Radio show has meant. You know, it's been important to our folks. Could you okay. just talk about that? Yes, no doubt about it. Obviously, we look at, there's a lot of work on like Black radio DJs, Georgie Woods out of Philadelphia, Jocko Henderson and the role of the civil rights movement and used radio. We also know people like Dick Gregory, Nina Simone, you know, gave free concerts. So obviously, you know, we get the talk radio in the 80s and 90s, we see that, again, it's before social media, this is before, you know, uh, CNN, that that was the information, that's where you went to get information, that's where you get, I mean, that's why I'm listening to Black Eagle about getting engaged with voting, getting engaged with, it's like civics 101 for a lot of people, including folks who've gone to college, it's like going back to the classroom every day, that, that consistency, but nevertheless, Black, black radio has been very important because it's an independent voice. It's not, you know, like being on CNN, MSNBC, you have to watch what you say. Uh, shows a wide range of perspectives. So again, like I said, all throughout this thing, we've all we've never been monolithic. You know, we've had SNCC, NAACP, or 
Joe versus Coleman Young. But ultimately, when yeah. Black folks are at their power is when we allow multiple perspectives and people to play their lane or their role. I, let me be a lawyer, you be the activist. I'm the historian, you're this. That's when we have most of our power. But I think oftentimes we watch CNN, it's either either or, either you're this mm -hmm. or you're that. Mm -hmm. Either you're this, or, there's no room for nuance. You have to have plan A or plan B. We argue, you pick a team and we don't connect. Either you're Malcolm X or you're Martin Luther King. But the reality is what Joe is showing through relationships, through right. working together, that's our power. You know, once we understand that, and of course, there's going to be young people who's going to, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm 53 years old and kids coming through have a whole different perspective. But when we work together and respect, you know, what we, like Joe says in the book about the torch, he gives a great story about, you don't need to put your torch out, right? We all need our torches on so we all can see that's bringing in the generational uh, unity that we should have. I think that's the power of these stories about relationships, the power of Black radio. And I know with social media now, you know, I think it's a challenge for younger generation to really get them to take time out to listen to radio. You know, I know there's a lot of podcasts now. There's so many podcasts, mm -hmm. you listen to no podcast. Everyone has a podcast now. But what I like about the Black Eagle is consistent. It's every day. It's, it's, you never, it's always authentic self, right? Getting engaged, being involved. And I think that's the power of this book. And there's plenty of stories in here. And, it, and it's motivational that you can, after you read this book, you don't want to do something. Get people registered to vote, you know, getting the word out, uh, uh, going against the misinformation, the disinformation. That's what's the power of, the, of Joe's story and Joe's memoir. It is. And that voice that memoir plays and the voice that he plays on the radio is just um, amazing. I mean, just to take it in a, in a totally different direction, but you know, this year, the Asala annual theme is black health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And Joe, you talk about issues of health on your mm -hmm. show. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember being absolutely floored when you were on Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. and he told you about your grandfather being a victim of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Right. Well, you, you shared that story on your show, but you did more than you showed your you shared your own personal health challenges. You talked to the audience about what's called black or health comorbidities, all the different types of illnesses that African Americans have, and sometimes in multiple ways. You talked about that through yourself, and, and I thought it was so wonderful the way you said that you could talk about yourself because you knew the people who were listening had these same problems. Um, that is an important health social justice issue, and could you just share that with us? Well, I, I found out, I found out, Dr. Higginbotham, that uh, I had uh, prostate cancer, and um, and of course, as you know, it, it is one of the leading causes of death, particularly among black men. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and it usually comes because we, we just, men just simply don't uh, do what they should do in getting checkups and physicals and, and that type of thing. So again, I use this platform uh, to, uh, to educate myself, and in doing so, I was educating the men and women, by the way, who were going through the same thing. And I could bring on all the different uh, doctors, the oncologists, and the surgeons, and that you know. And here are all the different uh, 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 methods to deal with prostate cancer. Well, in the process, I'm I'm educating myself. Yes. Uh, that's why I chose uh, the, the, my form of treatment, which was proton. Now it may work for, for other people and not and me or not other people. Everybody has to make their own decision. But one of the things I did while I was going through my proton, my cancer, prostate cancer treatment, I was doing my show hmm. and, and I would tell people, yeah. here's what I went through. Here's what I'm doing. What I found out was was that people were literally calling me and saying thank you because you were willing to talk about it. I went and got a prostate exam and I found out I had prostate. I can't tell you how many men 
have either text or called the show. We we mm. have a, a guy who just the other day called and said, you saved my life. Because I found out that, you know, my PSA was sky high. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and then uh, Sherry had a stroke while we were doing our show. Hmm. And we talk about it in, in, the, uh, in the book. In, in, in the book. She, she literally had a stroke. And uh, I saw the signs. And and again, immediately rushed her to the to the to the hospital. And again, it educated uh, uh, educated people. You, you don't get that kind of communication on cable news. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, you really don't. And and radio is so intimate. It, you know that's the that's it, it, that's the other thing. It, it's very intimate, and people uh re- related but you but it, so yeah, I, we in, included that that story we included how sherry said oh i feel okay i, I said look no no you and well I'll, and then she goes to the ladies room and laura coates the the, the uh the attorney laura coates who you see on mm-hmm. she she on, on cnn a lot she happened yeah. to be in the ladies room and she said mrs madison you i think you're having a stroke Look in the mirror. Here are the signs. The face is drooping. That type of thing, and and that's really what convinced her to come back to the studio. And to be honest, I shut down the <laughs> I shut down the radio show. I put my engineer and and Sam uh, Nassau, our producer, in charge, and we went to the hospital. And again, the response was thank you you know thank you because you you may have saved my life or you may have you know helped me but men men really men really responded it is fascinating how when men start talking to each other mm-hmm. about health issues they really let loose they really do talk to uh, they they really let loose you know some of our branches have had wonderful Zoom programs, webinars, where they have invited doctors to talk about these things. We also had a panel in our uh, virtual Black History Month, and we're going to have panels again like this in Montgomery. So I I really uh, hope that those of you who are watching will be sure to try to come to Montgomery um, because we're going to have, this is our theme, health and, and wellness. You know, I, I, I also love the story. You've just got to tell this one about your Black History Marathon. Mm. Uh, Joe ran a Black History Marathon that actually put his show in the Guinness Book of World Records category. So, Joe, could you share that story? We did. Uh, again, the, the Lonnie Bunch, I love him. He's a dear friend. Um, and you know, this was when we were raising money to, to get the, the, the museum built. And, uh, so I, I, I tried, I was thinking, how can I use the show to help raise money? And, I, and, um, I, I gotta give Al Roper a little credit. Al Roper did a weather broadcast marathon to raise money for some event. And he stayed on the air for uh, so many hours. I said, you know what? That's what I'll do. I will, uh, and and I said, let me see if there's a, a a Guinness Book of World Record for the longest radio broadcast. And sure enough, there it was, a talk radio broadcast, uh, and somebody held the record in some country. And I decided that's what I'm I'm going to do. And we, we stayed on, I, when I say we, because it takes a team to do this, uh, we stayed on the air for 54 hours straight. Mm. 54, <laughs> hours, 54 hours straight. And, and so, and, and people would contribute, you know, money. And, and now, now, you know, you black folk are something. Uh, most of the money didn't start coming in until the 50th hour. (laughs) 
you know. Because <laughs> I guess people said, "Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> he, he's gonna do this." And and we raised over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We raised two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, and and for the to help build the the, the you know. Um, and then I also, and I mentioned Dick Gregory a lot. Uh, we helped Dick Gregory get his star on the Walk of Fame. Dick Gregory should have got his star on the Walk of Fame yeah. decades ago. Yeah. And um, and people, so, but most people don't realize this. It cost about $30,000 to get a star on the, on the Walk of Fame. And we, I got on the, I got on the air and I said, we're going to get Dick a star on the Walk of Fame. So we had to fill out all these applications and we had to do it twice. And we ended up raising the $30,000 plus. That's wonderful. Like That's in, really wonderful. I, I think like in two weeks. That two is weeks. a wonderful story. And he, lived, Joe, long, he lived long enough to, to be there. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. You know, Joe, we're gonna we're running out of time, and I do have this very last question for you, um, and and it's a question or it's a story that you don't tell in your book, and the reason you don't tell it it in your book because your book was already published, and I'm referring to your hunger strike for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, it's a you you inspired a lot of people. You inspired ministers. I was fasting, not even going on a hunger strike, like I told you, but I definitely fasted. Um, talk about that, Joe, because it was very moving. Because historically, I, look, I, 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 I knew, and I'll, I'll make this quick, I knew what happened because of you historians, what happened after the first reconstruction. I knew what happened. I knew the first thing that they went after was the right to vote. The Klan was born, gun clubs, uh, Dr. Canton talks and writes about this in, to his class. And I said, that, uh, and, and so the people are protesting in front of the White House, trying to push the Senate to, to, to do, do away with the filibuster. And, and, and I was participating in all of these demonstrations with, with various groups. And, and I decided, you know what, I thought to myself, what would Dick Gregory do? Mm -hmm. What would he do? Well, first thing his son told me, he wouldn't ask permission to do it. He would, he would do it. And I had been on hunger strikes with Dick before. Mm. One of two things can happen when you do a hunger strike. And that is people can one, ignore you, or you get the attention of people in power. And so I decided, and I made this statement that just as food is essential, for the, uh, for the maintenance of life. The right to vote is essential to maintain democracy. And I'd be damned if I'm gonna let my children, grandchildren and great grandchild ask, hey, Pop Pop, what were you doing when the second end of the second reconstruction was, was taking place? What did you do? And that's when I decided that I was uh, that I would not eat any solid food until that John Lewis bill uh, was was passed. Now we almost did it. We only missed by 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 two votes. But uh, like you said, uh, once again, it goes back to Ron. What Ron Walters said: mm -hmm. all movements require sacrifice. And I've had mentors. I've had, and, and people refer to Gandhi, people mm -hmm. refer to Cesar mm -hmm. Chavez. These, mm -hmm. they were mentors because I had learned from historians that sometimes you have to sacrifice. And, it, and by the way, it's still a movement. We did wake up a lot of people. There are a lot of young people who didn't even know what a filibuster was. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know what, we ended up educating a lot of people about what it will take uh, to get our voting rights uh, protected. And I think it's still going to happen. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Now we're going to close, um, Michelle, uh, I, you know, we're, we're going to move it to the, 
to the audience. I, I, I just want to say this final word. I, I want to close with a quote from Joe's book. And it's from the book Jacket. And this is what it says. You can call his show anytime to complain about injustice in the world. Just be aware that the first question he's going to ask you is, what are you going to do about it? Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a couple questions. The first one is for you, Joe. It says, how can we buy your book or where can we buy your book? Um, it, it, it's online, I guess. Uh, Amazon. Uh, yeah, Amazon. Uh, yeah, it, it, you can go to joemadison.com and, and uh, it, it's uh, there. Dave, you, you the one. Yeah, if you go to joemadison.com and go right to Amazon, type in radioactive. There's a hard cover or a soft cover or ebook, it's right there. You can go ahead and get it that way. And for you, and, and thank you, Pam, and for you scholars, it's an e we, we deliberately <laughs> wanted to make it an easy read uh, in, in, my, in my voice. The, the biggest challenge I had with Dave was he's such a scholar that he would take a, a, a chapter and I'm saying, hey, Dave, it's 30 pages long. I mean, <laughs> you know, no, we, we had a we had a great time uh, putting putting it together. If you're ever going to you know work with somebody, let me and let me tell you, if anybody wants to write a book with a historian, I mean that I mean that sincerely. People write books with you know reporters and journalists. I would strongly recommend that if you if you're going to do this, you know, do it with a historian. They yeah. they they provide that perspective that's so important. And I, I think what also helped is because all the people you mentioned, Ron Walters, Julian Bond, you know, all these folks I've studied and read, and we can like finish your sentences at, at my content. Yeah. It, it works, right? So you right. say the four tops. You don't have to explain it. We got another story there, but there's nothing. Well, we, we, we had to explain to the editor who, who, who Levi Stubbs was. <laughs> <laughs> And we have similar, Joe's birthday is June 16th, mine is June 17th, so we're both Geminis. And the, ed and the editor was a Gemini. Yep, to my editor. I'm a Gemini. Oh, go on. And the, <laughs> and, and, the, and the designer of the book cover was a Gemini. Gemini, Team Gemini. <laughs> awesome. So our last one is kind of long. Um, it's a two- Part, I'm sorry, we have two more. It's a two-part question. It says, thank you for sharing your experience in the struggle for wealth of information. How far do you think we have come as an African-American community since the 1950s and 60s? And how far do you think we have come as a nation in the struggle for improved race relations since the 1950s and 60s? And do you think we have made any progress in the area or have we regressed? Oh, we've made progress. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, anybody that... Uh studies history, yeah, we've made a lot of progress. I'll answer the question quickly. How far do we have to, you know, to go? Uh, we got a long way to go. We, we, we haven't dealt with reconciliation. Um, it, it, I mean, we have, obviously, look what, look what has, has happened in Buffalo and, and, and Mother Emanuel Church. We got a long way to go. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I always quote, I quote one of my favorite quotes with Dr. King. He, in a sermon, he said, the two most dangerous things on the planet, sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Mm -hmm. and, and like, like I tell my students, right, we've made progress, right? You know, just oh, yeah. because you say you made progress doesn't mean there's no racism. It's always trying to get students to think out of the box, you know, and, and obviously if you look at the data, we live in longer, our income, poverty rates shows that there's been progress. So when students come in, oh, there's nothing changed since 1915. I have to stop them right there. So wait a minute now, there was no cable back then. I don't think I don't want to go back to 1915, <laughs> but, <laughs> but nevertheless, yes, but there is work to do, but obviously we see the work that Joe's doing. We have the history to show what to do work intergenerationally, you know, everyone has a, everyone, like I tell my students, everyone has a lane. Like think of life as a track race. Everybody has a lane. What's your lane? Do well in it. Work with someone else. I mean, you know, you don't want me fixing your car. I don't know what I'm doing. 
<laughs> but but I I had I, I one of the things and Dave referred to this. I, you always hear this. We got to pass the torch, you know, pass the torch. And I said this, and and I hope people understand. I'm not passing my torch. I'm going to hold on to my torch to the day I die. Rosa Parks held on that torch. Uh, yeah. Fanny Hammer held on to that torch. Here's yeah. what I'll do. I'll light your torch. And but but you, if I give you my torch, then I'm in the dark. Right. <laughs> Well, so, he says so, this in the book too. So buy the book. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and we have one final, one final question from an anonymous attendee who asks, "What does Dr. Canton suggest we do with young people to make them aware of our current goings on in America, and encourage them to act?" Well, that's a great question. I mean, well, first of all, there are young people acting, right? So we know there's young people who are engaged. So let's, you know, let's make sure we understand that narrative, right? So we know there's young people are engaged, but, you know, what are you passionate about? You know, find that passion. And then like Stoke and Carmen say, organize. I don't know how many speeches my dad took me, organize. Well, what does that mean? Study groups. I'll never forget uh, Willie Ricks, Mukasa. I was in Morehouse, you know, I'm ready to tear stuff up and you know what, Dave, why don't you start a study group? I'm like, a study group? Come on, brother. What's the study group? But that's where it starts from the ideas of like Joseph, you read when you read uh, uh, Before the Mayflower. Yes. Those ideas, that's where they oh. start through a group, through an organization. Then you decide what is that issue? You're not going to change the world overnight. Jesus didn't do that, but pick one issue. And like you said, commit and sacrifice. Don't show up on Monday and take six months off, but just start reading a group, a group, uh, a reading group, and then organize and mobilize. Definitely listen to Joe's show. But I think that's what young people need to do. So they are doing this, but we need to get more out there doing this work. Yeah, they came before the Mayflower yes. literally set me on <clears throat> the path of activism. And I had a chance to thank Lerone Bennett Jr. while when he was here. It, it literally uh, when I read, I got to be honest with you, when I finished that book in the basement of a library at West Hansen State, I literally started crying. Mm. It set me on the path of, 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 of activism. I, I think they, young people and, and older people too, but young people especially, they really need to know how important voting is. I, I think sometimes people just don't realize that so much of the future can depend on who you vote for. And um, it's, it's, you know, one thing you didn't talk about, I, I didn't get a chance to ask you, um, and if we don't have other questions, why don't you talk about that overground, overground railroad? <laughs> it, it was, again, history. I knew the history of the underground railroad. We, when I was with the political department, we marched, we did what we call, we called them overground because we, we went the same path about, it was, it was young, mostly young people, but it was intergenerational. Uh, we, we had one marcher who was like 80 some years old, but we, the first overground railroad, we actually retraced the path from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, all the way up to Detroit. And we actually walked the same path that the slaves took mm -hmm. on the Underground Railroad. And then we did the same thing. We went the East Coast. We went up the, the East Coast up to uh, New York. And then, you know, then the NACP branches said, well, you know, come on, we want to get in on this. And we trekked from Los Angeles to uh, Baltimore. And, and all along the way, we registered people to vote. Um, and, and, uh, and hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, voted. I saw uh, General Honore sent me a, a pie chart. X millions of people voted for Donald Trump in this last election. X million more voted for Joe Biden. And then he's had a chart where 100 million people did not vote. Hmm. See, and that's terrible. And I, and I saw in the chat 
people talk about the importance of voting at the local level, it is crucial because it's at the local level where all these books are being taken out of libraries, where Black mm -hmm. history is being denied in schools. It, you've got to, we've got to vote at every level. And I know some people think voting doesn't matter, but I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. If it didn't matter, if it, if it they not, wouldn't be trying it, so hard not to. Right. Do. Thank you. <laughs> Go out of their way, right, for voter suppression. Right. That means it matters. Exactly. Terrence or Michelle or Christina. And again, I think I was looking at uh, Carol Anderson's One Person No Vote. Yeah. They looked at George Bush one and how voting had declined, right? And I think again, Joe's work in the 80s is just we just get overlooked. How many people, the amount of exactly. people that's not registered, didn't participate. Even in Reagan's, I think Ron Walters showed to me that Reagan could have lost a second time if people came out and voted. So mm -hmm. it was like what Stacey Abrams says is math, not magic. If you want to win in Georgia, just go vote. She knows the numbers. So again, what Joe stresses on the show, what I do in my classroom. That's the power of talk radio because you're hearing it every single day. It's not that one segment on CNN where you get like six seconds. It's every day that he brings in the experts, Valerie Jarrett, all the folks who are experts, not not folks who are you know uh, not ex experts in the field to help you really you know get the understanding. So that's the power of the Black Eagle. It's consistent. It's like I said, authentic. It's bold, and it's you know it's a great teaching tool. I know yeah. you know. I use it in my class numerous times because a lot of these students don't, you know, don't have serious radio. So I bring it to them. Well, you can now put a, a, a plug, shameless plug. You can, uh, you can, I, I encourage people, all you gotta do is get a serious XM app and you now can, you don't need to be in the car. You can put it on okay. your, uh, on your device, your handheld device. This has been such an engaging discussion. Uh, we've got a couple more people that just threw questions out there, but they, they're pretty long. And so what I would hope is that maybe we could hear closing remarks with the, the little time we have left. Uh, Evelyn, would you like to lead that well, off? I gave my closing remark when I said, when I quoted from Joe where, you know, you, you listen and then you talk about injustice and then you go out and do something about injustice. Mm -hmm. Everybody can do something. All right, very good. Well, thank you all. Tonight has been so special. The dialogue in the chat has really been exciting. Uh, Joe, people just love your story. They love your message. They love your mission and David, Folks have really enjoyed your enthusiasm and how you offered such wisdom about uh, what you've shared with Joe. And Evelyn, as always, these reading rooms have just been spectacular. They've been fabulous. And having the Howard Mellon Grant, the Just Futures Grant, help us bring this to our audiences is, is just exciting. But uh, someone summed it up nicely in the chat just recently, and they talk about the Asala Conference and membership in Asala. So this is just the tip of the iceberg Absolutely. of what Asala brings. And I'm going to tell you, as you start seeing what we're going to have at Social Justice Thursday in Montgomery, you are going to want to be there and experience it in person. Thank you all so much. I'm looking forward to getting my copy of Radioactive and, and reading every word of it. Thank you, Joe, for sharing your story and your life with us. Mm -hmm. And I am also, I'm a Detroiter and I'm a Gemini also. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> this, this, well, you know, they, they, they always talk about us, but you know what, we're, as I always say, we're twice as good. That's right. <laughs> I like it. I want to also thank um, the staff who have been on the line helping us out, Nicholas and Christina and Terrence, as always, behind the scenes, making sure everything goes smoothly with technology. 
Thank you all for joining in tonight and making this reading room once again a very special place. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you all. Love you. Thank you.